Tonight on Cross Currents, destructive engagement, the shocking story of South Africa's war of terror against its neighbor states. The toll in human misery and economic chaos is incalculable. The question to be asked is why? Cross Currents with Jim Carney. All of us are aware of the many problems of Africa. Famine, poverty, regional wars, political instability. Most of us attribute these problems to, well, backwardness, ignorance, lack of civilized norms and institutions, lack of technology, even perhaps a kind of moral failure on the part of the African. Publicly, we abhor South Africa's policy of apartheid, but possibly many of us harbor a suspicion that maybe they're right. Maybe the black man isn't ready for self-government just yet. After all, look at the mess they make of things. Well, tonight's film, Destructive Engagement, may help blow these myths away. The film shows what many observers have long been saying, that at least in the southern half of the continent, the famine, poverty, and political chaos is not a result of the black nation's inability to run their affairs, but rather because of a systematic campaign by the Republic of South Africa to destabilize, that is, wreck, the economies and societies of its neighboring countries. Now, why would South Africa want to do that? Like all governments, South Africa describes its policies in the most virtuous terms. Essentially, it is defending Western civilization and its Christian values against the creeping menace of Marxism. Moscow is manipulating the ignorant black masses inside and outside South Africa as part of its diabolical global plan. Clearly, against this total onslaught, South Africa must mount a total strategy, incorporating military, economic, political, and diplomatic tactics. Well, let's look behind this heroic defense of Christian values and free enterprise. Over the past, say, 150 years of European colonization and industrial development, most of Southern Africa, not surprisingly, was turned into a marvelous machine to create wealth for the whites in the Republic of South Africa and for the economies of Europe and North America. Today, Southern Africa has become a vital market for South African goods and services, and a captive market at that. Historically, South Africa has controlled the region's economic infrastructure. If you wanted to export or import, you did it through South Africa. If you wanted to phone, buy, borrow, invest, ship, travel, you dealt with a South African firm. In addition, while South Africa likes to present itself as an industrialized nation, its manufactured goods in general are non-competitive in the world market. The quality is too low, the cost of production too high. But through the manipulation of import tariffs, freight rates, and subsidies, these goods become the only choice for black African states. In fact, during the mid-1980s, South Africa was earning about $2.5 billion a year in trade within the region and spending about half a billion. Then, of course, resources. South Africa is critically short of oil, electricity, and water. Within the region, however, there are enormous water and hydroelectric resources, coal reserves, and in Angola, oil. For more than a decade, South Africa has been partially dependent on electricity from Mozambique and Angola. She is attempting a controversial scheme to divert massive amounts of water from tiny Lesotho. For her own survival, South Africa must, as she sees it, remain the regional superpower. This gives some indication why the last thing the white South African government wants is a group of independent, prosperous, probably hostile black nations isolating her at the tip of Africa. This threat, presented as a communist menace, justifies the need for a powerful military force, which in turn creates a need for propaganda. That is, proof that the Marxist threat is real, that the border states are teeming with dangerous subversives, that harsh police 
military and economic action is necessary. The social and political havoc that this creates in the border states generates a genuine revolutionary reaction, which is encouraged, supplied, and exploited by South Africa, largely in the form of what are called surrogate armies, such as the MNR in Mozambique and UNITA in Angola. The real tragedy, aside from the appalling human suffering, is that virtually all of these countries are inherently rich. Mozambique, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Angola are verdant, fertile agricultural countries. All have substantial mineral resources, relatively well-educated populations. All should and could have reached much higher levels of social and economic development. The one fundamental requirement for social and economic development, true independence and self-sufficiency, the one thing that these countries need is peace. That is the one thing South Africa is determined they shall not have in the name of defending Christian values and free enterprise, of course. Now, destructive engagement. The explosion occurred just before dawn at a house in Harare's Avondale suburb. The neighbors said the house was used as two miles from the outlawed African National Congress of South Africa offices, which were last year the target of a bomb attack. Mr. Mulan had twice Africa visited the scene of the explosion, a double-story apartment building about a mile from the city center. He told reporters he had what he termed intelligence linking South Africa to the explosion, but he didn't go into details. The South African regime knows that it's fighting a losing battle. What it is now trying to achieve by destabilizing frontline states is to delay that day when appetite is no more. As the black majority in South Africa are more oppressed by the government state of emergency, Violent scenes like this have become commonplace. We are a strong and a proud nation. We have the faith and the ability to ensure our future. We ourselves will find solutions to our problems. We are determined to find them. We are doing it. But the way in which it is done and the time span in which it is done will be determined by ourselves. South Africa has never wanted to fight a war, a revolutionary war within its borders. Because it wanted to hide the reality of a civil war from the white population. It wanted to convey the impression or the facade of a, a peaceful country, of a prosperous country where there was peace and stability. With its military and economic might, South Africa has for the last six years been waging a full-scale war on its neighbors, the frontline states. Apartheid is the most exported system of the world. Uh, media in South Africa and politicians in South Africa accuse revolutionaries of exporting revolution. They export apartheid every hour of, the, uh, of their existence. They export apartheid through bandits. They export apart apartheid through economic sabotage, through political blackmail. They're always exporting apartheid. All the frontline states, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Zambia, and Angola, are living under fear and threat from South Africa. And each country can compute perhaps in billions what damage South Africa has caused. With smashed industry, restricted trade, famine and death, the frontline states are being devastated. If the situation was different, we would have used that money for capital development or economic development for the better living of our people. But we are forced by circumstances now to go for militarization. In Mozambique alone, according to the estimates of a recent UNICEF report, the death toll is 400,000 people, 
at least half of those children under five. All are victims of war. The South African government can, however, prevent the ANC from enjoying secure base facilities in neighboring states. In this regard, it is not only the government's right, but in fact, it is its, it is its duty, like that of all other countries, to protect its citizens against terrorism. The government will consequently take action against the ANC and its shelters when and wherever the situation demands. South Africa justifies this war by claiming the right to attack the ANC and its shelters when and wherever the situation demands. However, they constantly hit civilian, non-ANC communities as part of a total strategy of destabilization. It's keeping black Africa at bay. They have nothing to defend themselves against in relation to the neighboring countries. The neighboring countries don't want to attack South Africa. They don't have the capacity to, uh, to, to attack South Africa. The neighboring countries are merely saying what the rest of the world is saying, that they are opposed to their party system. This destabilization leads to deaths of innocent human beings either through deprivation or through bullets. The present South African policy of total strategy was heralded in January 1981 with a bombing raid on the Mozambique capital, Maputo. This was the first official cross-border raid since the invasion of Angola. However much South Africa pursues its policy of destabilization, in this case a euphemism for war, the opposition of the frontline states to the apartheid regime remains implacable. Mozambique, the South African government and military financed the Mozambique National Resistance, the MNR. Originally created by Ian Smith in Rhodesia, they terrorized the population, burning villages and mutilating their captives. According to the UNICEF report, roughly half the rural population are displaced within their own country. <laughs> Eu comecei a dizer ao meu marido, meu marido vai fechar a porta. Ele chegou e disse, leva a criança, deixar juntar toda criança. Eu juntei a criança, levou uma manta azul, uma manta azul, para conseguir levar, levar a criança, para pôr no colo. Levou, cobriu a criança, foi correr até subir ali em cima de Murumbar, até lá na praia. Chamaram meu marido, meu marido não aparece. Até chegar lá, na, na coisa chocolou não parece procurar a madia para procurar meu marido, não vi, procurar meu marido, não vi. Logo eu correu para no campo, ele no campo, e cagar ali, começar a ver bandido, começar a correr outra vez. Meu filho pequenino começou a chamar, mamãe anda cá, mamãe anda cá. Dois dias no mato. Com criança, sem nada, nem caplana, nem nada. Levou palha a cobrir. Coisa de cemitério. Yeah. 
For Limo troops, protect the families in displacement camps against MNR attacks. People don't run away from liberation. People don't run away from the ANC in South Africa. People do not run away from Frelimo in Mozambique, from the PIGC in, in, in Guinea-Bissau. They don't run away from the MPLA in Angola. They run away from the MNR. Why? Because they are not a liberation movement. They don't want to be linked to a band of murderers who are, above all, murdering for the military in South Africa. Despite the fertility of their land, peasant farmers can do little to cultivate as they are not safe from attack. A grande dificuldade primeiro é a alimentação para estas famílias. O vestuário para as mesmas famílias. Temos tido dificuldades em quantidades ínfimas de medicamentos que recebemos para o distrito, piorando agora que as populações estão a chegar continuamente na sede do distrito. With four and a half million people under the threat of starvation in Mozambique today, famine, man-made famine, has proved an effective weapon of war. Aqui realmente o primeiro ponto era de fome. Vivemos aqui um pouco tempo que as nossas mulheres nós também andávamos lumiar mangas de noite para aproveitar alimentar os nossos filhos. E parece-me que já não há nada agora acabou. Pensamos... É, a nossa preocupação muito, muito era disso. Em primeiro lugar, pelo menos ter de comer. Está aqui ainda há duas semanas, outras crianças também talvez estão a passar mal. Sim. Ainda estão a registrar também doenças de... de areia por de causa areia. das folhas de... que comem de qualquer de maneira. Comer. Problems of food distribution are compounded by the lack of roads and the shortage of trucks. Where there are roads, the trucks with food aid can get at least part of the way if they can avoid MNR mines and ambushes. But where there are no roads, the food can't reach those who are starving. And in many areas, the security situation prevents the people from reaching the relative safety of refugee camps. Eu realmente, como turista do Departamento Comercial da, da Faculdade de Naturais de Quilimane, sinto tido um problema muito grave durante a, a nossa saída para os distritos. Procuramos muitos perigos. Realmente, os bandidos andam, andam sempre a tentar violar a nossa mercadoria. E saímos daqui para Mocumba sempre temos tido problemas sérios de, de bandidos armados. Se medo tem, temos tido para que quando nos encontra às vezes mata-nos, né? Quando nos atacam nós sempre informamos que fomos atacados e depois temos aquela coragem para que nós temos sim, muita gente desalojada de bando armado que está no distrito. Agora, o governo e o Estado têm preocupado de nós podermos carregar o produto para poder abastecer, porque muitas crianças estão morrendo de fome lá fora. Estão morrendo de fome lá fora. Not only do the MNR attack food and fuel convoys, they also kill and maim civilians, often in horrific ways. Some of them are too horrible to talk about and uh, the Western media would move into a, an hysteria about African backwardness, instead of blaming the very people who they supported. Apartheid, South Africa. Uh, well, the most known uh, acts of terror include cutting of ears, cutting of lips, cutting of noses, severing arms, uh, you know, cut your arm, put it into your mouth and say, eat, 
Frelimo's food or Marshall's food, destroying villages, massacring uh, peasants, massacring passengers in buses, destroying the livelihood of people, destroying infrastructure. No dia 11 de julho do ano passado, chegaram os bandidos armados em minha casa e quando chegaram, a primeira coisa, deram licença. Quando deram licença, eu julgava que fosse minha família. Quando saí para fora, encontrei então katanas, machados, zagaias. Um deles perguntou-me, Ei, você, que é este que é Raimundo Buxapa, o professor mais antigo do tecido da Bangladesh da Costa? Eu respondi que sim. Disse então, eu vou ser mesmo sempre que anda a as crianças, dizer, abaixa bandidos armados. Eu disse, o senhor como está a afirmar assim? Conforme vamos ter a dizer, dizer que não sou professor, não pode dizer que sou professor, sim, senhor. Então segura bem primeiro. Mandou os outros para me segurar. E seguraram-me. Eita, ficaram já três espingardas, eu no meio. Levanta-te. Então eu levantei. Você é professor já há 35 anos, não é? A gozar aqui, diz sempre, vai ser as crianças, não é? Agora tira para mim. Então eu comecei a tirar. Tira depressa. Você agora vai morrer. Porque você é professor. Está a instruir as, as crianças. Ah, sim, sim. mas que eu vou morrer por quê? Desiste porque você foi a Maputo passear. Logo então, pronto. E fica bem. Eu fiquei. Depois, olha aqui. Catana. Levaram para Catana. Olha para quê? Não, eu não tinha maneira, tinha que, tinha que aceitar. Logo então, fiquei assim. Logo quando ele tirou, tirou a vida da espada, então eu virei assim. Quando virei então, logo, pá, e eu caí. Quando caiu, eu disse, ai meu Deus, disse, nós também somos cristãos. Não vale a pena falar do nome de Deus. E começaram a me cortar. Daí. E vieram cortar também aqui. Deixaram. Das quatro, das quatro horas de madrugada do dia 11 até ao meio-dia, estive lá no sol. Então, quando vieram a tropa, levaram-me e levaram diretamente para aqui, no, no hospital, de Central de Crimane. Frelimo's forces now have British military training in their fight against the South African-backed MNR. The bandits they capture are taken to rehabilitation camps. Their stories reveal how they were recruited. Some were hungry and offered food. Some abducted from their villages and forced to join. Others, who were working illegally in South Africa, were offered the choice, prison or fight for the MNR. Este centro nasceu através de uma amnistia oferida pelo Partido Frelim aos bandidos armados. As tendência do bandido armado é raptar, matar, saquear bens da população. Não há nenhum exército que luta contra a população. O exército luta contra outro exército. Não luta contra a população, mas o bandido armado mata populações. Aqui em Moçambique, mata. Rouba os bens. Chega, apanha uma aldeia como esta, queima. Apanha a escola, queima. Mata professor, mata os alunos. Portanto, dá a entender que ele não tem política, o bandido armado. É isso, um cargador que eu vi em Colômbia. Então, vi que então, o movimento deixa de andar e viver e de qualquer coisa de, de roubar e tudo, houve combate, aonde morte, não morte. Então, prefiro eu ir desentregar sozinho, do que eu ficar só aqui na mata, ser matado de graça 
e a meus família não me fica onde quero morrer. Não, este é o nosso povo, que nosso povo não podemos perder. É como um pai quando lhe, quando lhe foge uma criança e esta criança voltar, nunca lhe deixa. Recebe a criança, coloca-la numa casa. Agora não tem. Despite constant denials by the South African government, their continued support for the MNR was brought home by the quantities of weapons captured in February by Zimbabwean forces in Mozambique Zambezia province. So we have discovered uh, a lot of weapons that are been uh, supplied by the South African Defence Forces. We have uh, uh, impounded documents which uh, uh, were with the MNR, but they are from the South African Defence Force or that wing of it which is supporting the, uh, the, uh, the bandits, uh, instructing them on what to do and how to uh, do various things. So the evidence is quite uh, you know, conclusive. <laughs> Zimbabwean troops are fighting in Mozambique to protect vital transport routes to the sea. Helped now by troops from Tanzania and Malawi, it is crucial for the region that Mozambique does not collapse under South African pressure. Zambia and its neighbor Zimbabwe are both landlocked countries. Their exports are almost totally dependent upon access to the coast. The shortest route for Zambia's copper belt is the Benguela Railway, west through Angola. For Zimbabwe, routes east through Mozambique, the Chikwalakwala Railway link to Maputo, and the rail, road and pipeline to Beira. Due to the sabotage of those routes, the only alternatives available in recent years are South African ports and railways, at the additional cost of over 300 million US dollars per year. Of all Zambia and Zimbabwe's links to the outside world, South Africa has allowed only one to remain open, Bait Bridge. This is the bottleneck through which all bulk traffic must pass. It represents a powerful economic weapon, and as South Africa has already demonstrated, they can close the line at will, as they did for a period in 1982, cutting virtually all trade to and from Zimbabwe. If we were to uplift all the traffic from the Sadic region overnight and put it through Bara, if we could do that, we would probably save this country 85 million US dollars a year. So it gives some indication as to the cost uh, to our import and export industries by using the longer routes at the moment and what could be achieved in savings by using the shorter routes. <laughs> The saving to the Zimbabwean steel industry, which is forced to ship 95% of its production via South Africa to Mozambique, would be enormous if it could ship directly to Mozambique. Regrettably, it is expensive for us to ship our products through South Africa. We lose on an average of 60 Zimbabwe dollars per ton, and that is a valuable foreign currency lost. And in our view, we would like to have the Chikwala Kwala line running, and we would be in a position to earn more for our products on the international market. The bar is only 300 kilometers, something of this sort, as opposed to sort of 2,000 kilometers. If you're looking further north, um, then you've got an awful long way to go before you can get a boat. So obviously, Barra, um, from our point of view, is, is a natural port. And um, you know that the, the development that's taking place now with the Barra line and, and the Barra corridor um, is, is a tremendous advantage, you know, not only to us, but, but to everyone involved in exporting.
what we have said, what the Prime Minister has said is that one, we will not allow RNM to take over in Mozambique. Uh, two, uh, we will keep the barrier corridor open at every cost. We have had attacks. We've had uh, a number of attacks here in recent weeks, probably one a week. They tend to be uh, of a sabotage nature. It's a landmine on the railway line or explosive charge on the pipeline. Uh, the MNR seem to avoid uh, ambushes. They seem to avoid frontal attacks. And I think the reason for that is the fairly high density of troops which are now occupying that corridor. So in other words, they're, they're fighting shy of a, of a confrontation with the troops. But the MNR continue to sabotage the line. On the night of the 12th, uh, bandits placed explosives on this bridge. This has been one of the worst uh, uh, acts of bandity on the section since we've arrived here. This closed the track for three days. No trains were able to cross this bridge. This was one, a major one. It was heard throughout the area here, and in actual fact, it set panic to the, to the population here. We've also had many minor acts further up the line where trucks uh, have been derailed, but those were minor where we took one, day, one or two days only. The Zimbabwe security forces are manning right along the line uh, in conjunction with Frolimo, but uh, it is a difficult situation. Zimbabwe and Mozambican railways are working together to rehabilitate the Beira corridor. We are helping the Mozambique just because they, they, won't, they won't afford to make this lady run or to, re, to maintain this lady run. <laughs> the bandits which are being sent by the South Africans want to destroy this, this lady run, but due to the fact that we have, we have got the army which, are, which, which is protecting this lady run. They won't afford to destroy this little grind. We want to we want our country to develop just because we want the, those minerals which we dig in, the, in our country to export them to other countries like Germany, France, Italy, and so forth. And at the same time, we want to export cotton, which we which we grow in, the, in our country other countries. It is one thing to attack a demoralized, defeated Mozambique, but I think with international projects uh, supported by international funding, personnel, they might find the target gets a little stronger. If something is worth having, I think it's worth defending, and we, we are beginning to, to uh, improve our throughput along these lines now. We're serious in our attempt to uh, have an economic saving to this part of the world. We've got to be prepared to pay for it. Beira is the end of the line. With the aid of EEC and other international finance, SADC, the Southern African Development Coordination Conference, is rehabilitating Beira Port. SADC is a grouping of the frontline states seeking to reduce dependence on South Africa. Part of South Africa's long-term strategy has been to remain the dominant economic and political power in Southern Africa. SADC is one way in which the frontline states can resist. The attack on the Somabula Farmers Club, about 18 miles south of Gweru, is reported to have been staged by at least three men at about 9.30 last night. Zimbabwe is not free from dissident attacks, which produce economic disruption and are designed to drive a political wedge into Zimbabwean society. Since independence in 1980, more than 40 white farmers have been killed in the southwestern region of Matabili land. Well, we had hoped that with independence and the end of the war that the security problems would cease. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. In recent years, the banditry in the towns has ceased, but it's continued in the rural areas on, on an off-and-on basis. Um, we've had um, farmers attacked in their homesteads, murdered, uh, ambushes on roads, ambushes at set points like dips, buildings burnt and destroyed. 
And this did cause a great loss of confidence. And a considerable number of farmers left the land. After a series of murders in the Casey South Marula area, we had to withdraw all the farmers from that area. Uh, this obviously was very detrimental. And after discussions with government, we were able to establish farm militia. Uh, I, we were able to put, give farmers guards on their farms. And since then, uh, morale has improved considerably. And um, we are getting a return of people to the land. So who are these people attacking white farmers? They're certainly uh, established locally. Uh, they're able to operate locally. But who controls them, um, we don't know, and we have no way of finding out. There is a way of finding out. The origins of weapons found after some of these raids have been obscured. But the bullets, identified by their markings, 2280, can be traced back to South Africa. The same type has been found after attacks on the line in the Beira Corridor. So, whether itself or through surrogates, South Africa has hit many targets within the frontline states. Zambia, where indeed the African National Congress does have its headquarters, has suffered repeated South African attacks on civilian targets. Now, just now, we've got a number of South Africans under custody, recently arrested uh, for programs which would lead to the destruction of our property and possibly would result in deaths of human beings. Uh, they have been training 120 Zambian dissidents with the help of the rebels in Angola, the Unita rebels. We know they're training about 2,000 Zambians in Namibia. All this obviously is meant to uh, destabilize us even more. And the Zambians are having to cope with thousands of refugees who have poured in from the war zones. <laughs> Over the years, more than 130,000 refugees have arrived, and many more continue to come. In the east, from famine and fighting in Mozambique. In the south, from Namibia and South Africa. And in the west, from the devastation in Angola. War in Angola has been on a wider scale than anywhere else among the frontline states. South Africa has invaded several times and maintains a continuous presence in parts of the South. After a month of some of the heaviest fighting in the 17-year guerrilla war, South African troops were today withdrawing from their forward positions 100 miles inside Angola. The vehicles spaced out to avoid ambush formed a convoy 20 miles long as it headed south for the border. The first South African invasion took place in 1975 to try to prevent the new MPLA government taking power at the time of independence. The withdrawal, which is said to have started last Sunday, had been delayed by bad... Weather. Dealing with Angola is different from any of the other frontline states, for Angola has oil. Much of the exploration has been undertaken in joint ventures with European and American companies. But the United States is in a paradoxical position here. Whilst Angola is one of the USA's largest African trading partners, the American government has refused diplomatic recognition to Angola. Oil installations have been among South Africa's direct targets. Here at Namib, 
South African commanders were successful. Afterwards, we gave the attack team together again. Once on the speedboats, we returned to the mothership. The charges were safely detonated and South Africa claimed the operation. This was the operation launched with the aim of destroying the all storage tanks in Cabinda Gulf. As we was but at Cabinda in 1985, two members of a daring sabotage raid were killed and one was captured. Several small uh, FAPLA patrols passed the area. One FAPLA soldier saw something move through the short grass and they opened fire. In 1975, both Angola and Mozambique won independence from Portugal. The new governments took over nations with largely illiterate populations and economies which had been systematically sabotaged by the departing Portuguese. Since then, both nations have been ravaged by war. In Mozambique, one of terror and destruction. In Angola, a more conventional war, conducted by the South African Defense Force and UNITA, the rebels backed by South Africa and the USA. Neste momento, quer dizer, nós, o, o nosso inimigo principal, é, como ponta de lança do solo africano, é a UNITA. Mas só que a UNITA não faz ações diretas. Quem vem é, a, é o solo africano, porque o, o solo africano, depois de, de, de desbaratar as nossas unidades, então ele deixa lá a UNITA. Só que a UNITA, quando se aproxima das nossas, das nossas forças, ele retira-se de novo. No momento desta área não existe a UNITA, mas sim, a UNITA, só muitas vezes que sai dentro do interior da Namíbia por aqui, junto com o Mista Costura Africano, na área onde que acabei de dizer agora, onde estão as suas concentrações, violar as mulheres, roubar e matar os gados do povo. Mas ele, para já, para chegar até aqui, nós não, a UNITA para nós não é nada. Mas a situação preocupante é o gesto sul africano. UNITA forces have direct backing and recognition from the USA. And in Mozambique, the MNR have received funding from right-wing American and Portuguese groups. Neither UNITA nor the MNR could have survived without this backing. A gente que vive aqui, toda a gente, a população sabe de antemão a política que a UNITA faz contra a população. Porque de... de... De antemão, o povo sabe que a UNITA, quando vem, mata populares indefesos, porque quando as nossas a nossa unidades não vêm, vem para poder roubar. Ainda ontem à noite, ontem à noite veio aqui um, um popular que veio aqui, um grupo de UNITA por ali, que naquela na via que liga Xangongo, veio lá para saquear as coisas do povo, roubar a roupa, é, comida, é, mantas, é, é a ação que faz contra o povo. E o povo realmente sabe quem é que está a defender o povo. The display of captured UNITA weaponry shows the extent of their Western support, whilst precious little support flows to their victims from anywhere. The problem is the first and most grand. Now in the hospital, there are many difficult problems. There is no agis, no apens, no água, no às vezes a eletricidade. Eu vou explicar né, quando eu estou a perguntar este problema. Uh, parece que uh, estes pessoas que têm arma e atiram crianças, mulheres e velhos, uh, parece que esta pessoa uh, um, não não nenhuma uh, estuda nenhuma classe. Ele não sabe nada, porque qual normalmente a pessoa pode atirar crianças? Nunca vi. Este só isso. Eu estou a perguntar. E antes eu também eu penso que esta pode ser. Esta não é verdade. Quando não vi as suas uh, olhos, eu nunca vi, nunca uh, pensar antes que 
poder extra. Nunca. Quantos filhos você tem? Eu tenho sete. Sete filhos. Marido, tem? Tenho. E você apanhou a mina onde? Estava a fazer o quê? Foi no capango para apanhar uma coisa, um cravão para vender. Sim. Depois a chuva começou a chover, depois entrou no, coisa, no cedro. Depois apanhou uma coisa, mina. Uhum. Mora mesmo aqui no Calombrinco. Uhum. Veio aqui em 1968, aqui no Ambo. Saiu no Bailundo. Uhum. Uhum. Quem você acha que põe as minas? No, a mi, pôs a mina que lhe fez isso. Quem foi? Eu não sei também. Tá eu disse assim, vou apanhar essa coisa, vou ficar aqui, porque tem a chuva, tenho nenê. Depois de apanhar uma coisa, mina, hum. porque ficou com o neném nas costas. Hum. Mines are sown in the fields where people go to work. Few are killed, but many are seriously maimed. The clear intention is to tie up as many resources as possible in caring for the wounded. There are perhaps 20,000 limbless people in Angola. The lucky few have access to the Red Cross Hospital here at Huambo, where they can be fitted with artificial limbs and taught to walk again. Disabling people, disabling chances of material progress and peace. Those are the aims of the rebels. Some places, like this School of Agricultural Science, are targeted for repeated attacks. It was bombed in March 1987 for the third time. When, de facto, a confrontação não é possível, quando, quando nada mais há a fazer, resta apenas a vida, a destruição pura e simples de objetivos que nada têm a ver com, com objetivos militares, não é? é? Efetivamente, a explicação só pode ser essa. É, de facto, uma atitude que, que demonstra que, de facto, não, não há nenhum outro objetivo por parte da UNITA que não seja a destruição pura e simples das instituições, das estruturas, sejam elas económicas, sejam elas de interesse social, da, da República Popular de Angola. By the destruction of places which could help revitalize the economy and the constant threat of bombs and mines, the Angolans are prevented from rebuilding their society. Together, South Africa and the rebels have destroyed vast areas of southern Angola with the displacement of hundreds of thousands of people. It's a question of war. The situation is this, the war that we have been moved through the African country, is é violando e roubar o gado todo o bem do povo angolano é a causa principal que nos trouxe cá. Aqui, lá nós tínhamos tudo. Não, não só bens alimentares e coisas, mas também tínhamos regalias, os nossos campos, os nossos bens, quando que diz respeito ao animal, gado bovino, caprino, cavalgar, tínhamos tudo. Enquanto aqui não. Aqui está mesmo sim, uma regalia diferente, muito idêntica à que a tínhamos. Aqui. Há uma grande diferença. Muito bem, quero mesmo. Até mesmo que fosse hoje, teria uma intenção mesmo positiva de voltar. Uma vez que eles não nos matem, eu não tenho medo de lá estar, mas a causa principal é que mano, nos matam. E tenho medo de ser morto. Quando atacaram a província do Cunin, algumas escolas foram destruídas e morreram alguns dos nossos pioneiros e professores. E dali fugimos para a província vizinha, que é a província da Huila. Quando nos encontramos até agora. 
e os sul-africanos continuam a massacrar, a massacrar o nosso povo em algumas áreas do, do Cunene, até a data. techniques that you need to employ are often barbaric. These men, women and children at Dima slept in trenches as shelters against South African bombing raids. There they were massacred by UNITA. The shelters became their graves. against humanity. It's uh, the most diabolical, racist system that has uh, been known by mankind. Just as it took uh, many, the deaths of many people to uh, eliminate Nazism in Europe, it will take the deaths of many people to eliminate apartheid in, uh, in Southern Africa. It's a price that we must pay and we are determined to pay it. Apartheid is a crime against humanity. If it's against humanity, it's not only against the front line. So humanity must, be, must get involved. The governments of the world must get involved. The end of apartheid depends on two things. The struggle of the people inside South Africa. And secondly, international pressures, which do not have come to come from the neighboring countries. It's the international community. And uh, no amount of uh, aggression against neighboring countries uh, is going to save a party. I think uh, South Africa faces a crisis it has never faced before. Uh, it faces a serious economic crisis. Uh, the army is overstretched. The army is involved in Namibia, in Angola, is involved with the MNR. But now, for the first time, the army is actually involved within South Africa. We have one superior weapon, moral right. Political morality is with us. They have a rotten system to defend. And nothing like that is defendable in the long term. So we are ready to sacrifice, as we have done before. And that sacrifice, that spirit of sacrifice, is more than enough to destroy the apartheid regime, strong as it is in economic terms, strong as it is in military terms. Victory is certain in the end. In 1980, the nine black countries of Southern Africa formed the Southern African Development Coordination Conference, or SADC. Its primary goal is to liberate their economies from their dependence on South Africa. But SADC relies on international aid for its projects. By 1986, it had identified $5 billion worth of projects, mostly for transportation and communications. At that time, more than $1 billion had been committed, and another billion was under discussion, considered a remarkable international response. At the same time, 
Sadek reported that between 1980 and 1984, South Africa's destabilization policy had cost Sadek members close to $10 billion in actual war damage, increased military expenditures, lost production, and so forth. Today, it is probably closer to 20, if not $30 billion, far more than all of the foreign aid received over the same period. The kind of small-scale, irregular war seen in the film tonight has been endemic throughout Africa for the past 30 years. The history of the independence period reeks with the bloody memories of the Belgian Congo, Nigeria, the Central African Republic, Rwanda, Uganda. These are often reported to us as nothing more than primitive tribal conflicts. There's often far more to it than that. And this recurrent indiscriminate warfare has a tragic human byproduct, not only the dead and the crippled, but the refugee. Africa is now estimated to have more than five million refugees, half the world's total, and the numbers continue to rise. Next week on Cross Currents, a film called Fugitives in Africa examines this man-made disaster. Here's a preview. Africa used to be known by outsiders for its mystery and its beauty. Now it is better known for its poverty, its wars, and above all, for its refugees. Once upon a time, in another country, these people were farmers. They had cattle, they had crops, they had families, and they had future. Now they live a suspended existence. They have lost control of their own destiny. <laughs> Fugitives in Africa, next week on Cross Currents. If you'd like some more information on any of the topics in this series, you can send for the viewer's guides we've prepared. There's one for each program, and I'm sure you'll find them of interest. For Cross Currents, I'm Jim Carney. Good night. Viewer's guides for each program in the Cross Current series are available at a cost of $2 each, or $15 for the full set of 10. You can obtain your guides by writing to The Knowledge Bookstore, Post Office Box 94000, Richmond, B.C., V6Y 2A2. If you prefer, you can phone the bookstore at one of these numbers, 660-2190 or toll-free, 1-800-663-9711. And you can charge the order to your Visa or MasterCard. Once again, the cost of these informative guides is $2 each, or $15 for the set of 10. Order yours now. Thank <laughs> you.